Um, wallet management as well is a module, and I think somebody had asked earlier how private keys work. There is no central registration of keys. Uh, you can quite literally declare your own key by taking a random number, uh, a 256 bit number, and that's your private key. You don't declare it to anybody, certainly. Uh, that is between you and your computer, and the network doesn't need to know about it. You can just start signing off on transactions using that random number. And that's how identities are declared on the network. Uh, it's very decentralized and it works very well thus far. Uh, there's a theoretical collision where you could uh, perhaps choose at random somebody else's private key, uh, but then again, I think there's a theoretical condition where you have the same DNA as somebody else who, who isn't your twin, so it's a very far off chance, uh, I would suggest. Uh, payment processing is another module as well, and um, that has to do with validating payments and facilitating transactions, essentially. Um, a couple of uh, structures and algorithms for the programmers that would be important. Uh, certainly a competent knowledge of what hashing is would be appropriate. Uh, SHA-256 is the primary hashing mechanism. Uh, RightMD is used uh, mostly for public key hashes for the purposes of distributing amongst humans. Uh, it's a smaller number, it's easier for people to understand. Uh, there is some ECDSA. Uh, I think uh, primarily on the contracts themselves, the signer of a transaction would encrypt his script. Um, Merkle trees are uh, also part of the code. We'll get into that in a bit. Uh, a Merkle tree is very much like a binary tree, uh, wherein a node is a hash and the leaves are the data. Um, that's used to ensure validity of transactions within a block. Uh, and balloon filters are used uh, as well on some of the newer uh, code base. It's a probabilistic filter, which will tell you if one entity is in a set. Um, we won't get into most of that here. I'm just throwing that out there for the programmers who uh, may want to take this upon themselves. Let's talk about the P2P network. Uh, the P2P network is actually pretty simple. Uh, compared to, say, even HTTP, there's not a lot of challenge response, there's not a lot of dialogue. It's primarily a broadcast mechanism. Um, there are the notion of inventories and, and uh, stashes, I suppose, of state in the form of an inventory on the network. Um, one such inventory would be blocks or the blockchain. Uh, another such inventory would be um, unconfirmed transactions. Uh, yet another inventory uh, would be um, peers. And I think another form of inventory would be uh, broadcast messages. We'll get to those in a second. Um, when you connect to the network, you have a version of your inventory. You have a version of that state. And that version is a number that starts at zero and increments. So maybe I'm last connected to the network where my uh, inventory for the block state is 300. I would then advertise my presence on the network. I would find out that the current level is 305. I would then download the five blocks that were waiting for me. Thereafter, if a new block comes along from a miner, an advertisement would be sent to me where I would see that the state of that blockchain is now 306. I would download the newest block, and now I'd be at the current version of that inventory. Uh, and that works for peers. Uh, that works for um, all, everything else that I mentioned before. Um, part of that, too, there, there's an inventory of system messages, and I find this very interesting. Uh, I don't see this publicized very often, but uh, Satoshi built into the protocol the ability to do an APV, essentially, and to let everybody know if something is going on. Um, if a message comes down the line and it is signed by Satoshi's key, we will all see it. Uh, there is this possibility in the future that we will get a message from Satoshi in this way. Uh, he turned that private key over to uh, Gavin, and um, Gavin has that ability as well. Uh, to my knowledge, they haven't used it in a very long time. Uh, but I like the idea of there being a bat signal of sorts in the network, uh, because it's there. Um, when a midpoint slide starts, you had a question? You're I'm saying sorry. Gavin has that key? Correct. Gavin and uh, Satoshi. I don't think Jeff has it, but it wouldn't surprise me if he did. Thank you. Sure. Um, when the P2P client connects to the network, um, it connects to a seed server via DNS. Uh, in prior versions, this used to be connecting to an IRC channel, uh, where he would then download peers, and from those peers, he would perhaps get more peers. Um, it does listen on port 8333 uh, for connections from peers requesting messages. Uh, and then once messages are received, the inventory of those peers is kept in state and um, relayed accordingly. And, and that's the gist of the P2P network. There's not a lot of logic that gets done in the network uh, from a communication standpoint. Uh, there is a validation on all of those messages that is important. Uh, and we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, so let's move on to what a transaction is. Uh, this, again, is probably the most complex part of the protocol. Uh, it's certainly where most of the logic is. Uh, I'd like to liken it to a check uh, in paper form. And when we think of what the blockchain is even, uh, it is a, a compilation of every transaction that has ever been. It is a big ball of checks, essentially, um, with every check referencing the check prior uh, that was in the person's name. So if I receive a check from Mary for $200, uh, and then I wanted to spend $100, uh, on my second check, I would reference the first check from Mary, allocating $100 from that check onto the next person. And when a, when a uh, amount is received by anybody on the network, uh, the network will go through the chain of checks to whatever degree is necessary to ensure that that money is available. 
Uh, and, and I'll show you a chart here in just a second that will better clarify that. Uh, yes? All right, so this, this kind of blows that anonymity, non-trackable part of Bitcoin out of the water here. I mean, you just said that, if I understood what you said, there's a, there's a, a breadcrumb trail all the way through every transaction. That's correct. So I don't actually like to weigh in too much on the anonymity question because I see anonymity on a spectrum. Uh, much like on the internet, there's anonymity on a spectrum. When you make a forum post, nobody knows who you are in some context, but I guess the NSA would know in some other context. And then you can use Tor as well to further obscure who you are. And you have similar options in, in, in Bitcoin. So I, I don't like to suggest that there is or isn't anonymity. I, I would suggest that anonymity is on a spectrum. Uh, and so the degree that it is on that spectrum is, is really needs to be played out, I think, in, in well, the market. Well, I'm just concerned because, you know, having had some relationship with the IRS as all of us have in the past, that uh, mm -hmm. this is an auditable paper trail, essentially, it's just as compressed into a, uh, you know, a code or right. a sort of series of uh, code. So certainly, I think paying your taxes is your patriotic duty, and I would not advocate otherwise to anyone. Um, that being said, there is this coin join mechanism that is pretty smart. So unlike checks, where there's always a single input, in Bitcoin, there can be multiple inputs. So uh, for a lot of good reasons, you wouldn't want people to know your finances. Uh, certainly, if you're a company, you have a payroll, and you have to pay out uh, to individuals, you may want to keep their salaries private. Or maybe you're doing business in your company, you don't want your competitor to know what your uh, Black Friday sales came in at. Uh, so there is the coin join application wherein, um, and, and this probably could be its own presentation, you can uh, amalgamate a number of transactions into a single transaction and explode them out into different directions essentially. And that's a bit dramatic, but that's kind of what goes on. And it becomes a, um, a forensic process from there. And you can do that multiple times. Uh, and you can also check in and out of all coins. So if you wanted to go out of Bitcoin into uh, dark coin or some such thing, um, you would have those options. So a lot of this is going to be a cat and mouse game. Uh, but yes, paying taxes is your patron activity. Do you have a question? <laughs> no, I was just going to say that uh, the DOJ is actually auctioning off all the support of one Bitcoin itself. So if they were that concerned about trying to track down everyone that touched those coins and all the lineage, they probably wouldn't want to add more transaction heap on top of those coins to... Well, it's funny. Would I? And you're going to buy Bitcoin from the DOJ? I'm not personally, but they're going to be out of circulation. Well, they cleaned it. That's, that's the funny part about it, is that they have cleaned that money for you, and now you can use it. So I, <laughs> you can take whatever out of you want. Yeah, there's a lot of these sort of themes in here. So you're saying that the DOJ just wanted all that money? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Not that much for what million? That's a lot of it. So, yeah, the, the concept of the transaction is important that you understand that there is an input uh, facility and an output facility. Um, and we'll... And we'll Diagram that for you in just a second, so I'll come right back to that. Uh, I think it's also important that you understand that there is no actual uh, specific allocation uh, of value within the transaction. There is a mini language, it's a, a, it's a fourth base, we'll get to that too. Uh, but there's a mini language that facilitates the transaction, um, and it is a, a contract. And very much like checks, which are also contracts, there may be a simple contract, which is that I pay you uh, five coins or some such thing. But it is always a contract, but there's not an actual field for assignment. Um, there is, you will see this often, uh, Bitcoin's uh, transactions being used for data. In that case, uh, what's going on there is uh, that the contract is pushing data onto the stack of the language and it is not actually a field of this data. There's no metadata type of field. Uh, it's really a program created for pushing values onto the stack. Uh, typically, those are not spendable. Uh, so if you're putting data on the blockchain, uh, you're usually pissing money away. Does it actually handle blog, blog type data then? Well, yeah, absolutely. There is a maximum size that uh, would be probably in your interest, although the protocol doesn't define it. But uh, if you wanted to get mined into a block, you have to make it worth the miner's while. So you have to tip to some degree based on the return. It's a little complicated, the formula, but absolutely. And people will put everything in there. Um, you know, uh, pictures of Homer Simpson, uh, parts of the Bible, you name it. It's in there. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I think, the most, uh, I guess, about the data component. Uh, it's, right, it's important. It's important to note that there's two types of outputs, essentially, spent and unspent. Um, the spent output has been allocated to somebody who then turned around and spent it. Uh, unspent outputs uh, are available for spending. When you look at your phone and you want to see what your balance is, what your phone is roughly doing is looking through all of the checks that were in your name that have not been spent or have only been partially spent, and that's how it calculates your balance. Um, those are abbreviated UTXO. You'll see that in the code a lot. You'll see that elsewhere. Um, when a miner processes your transaction, uh, and this is a subtlety, but it's worth noting. Um, what he typically receives in the form of a tip is an input that hasn't been output. So if I have four Bitcoins allocated to a transaction and three Bitcoins allocated out, that delta of one Bitcoin becomes the minor tip. Uh, just kind of a subtlety. 
Uh, and then lastly, and this is very important, there are two types of transactions. There are regular transactions, and then there are coin-based transactions. Regular transactions are everything that I just described. Coin-based transactions are newly printed money. That is a, a Genesis transaction that is uh, present in every single block that is the reward for mining. And that's how money is generated in the form of a, a version check that has no uh, signatory from which it came, but which is allocated to the miner. Uh, that's one of the functions and benefits of being a miner. Yes, sure. So the miner tip is the cost per transaction. Correct. And isn't there a miner or mining company that owns a loss of 50% of the transactions right now? Correct. Well, so GigaHash hit 51%. And oh. that's a separate issue. And I would absolutely love to talk about that. But I would like to give you a little bit more information on what the, what the function is um, of a miner before you tackle that. Because I think that'll help. But it's a very hot topic right now. It's a very important one. Um, right, so I'm going to give you a quick uh, diagram here of a, of a 25 Bitcoin economy. Um, I've simplified a lot of what would actually be going on in this economy. All we have is a coin-based transaction. Uh, it was mined by Bob. Uh, it was a 25 Bitcoin reward. Uh, there would be, uh, in that block, multiple transactions, of course, but I'm taking them out just to make things simple. Bob, in this case, wrote two transactions, two checks. Uh, one was output to Charlie at the top. One was output to Alice at the bottom. Uh, you can see that each of those transactions reference a uh, subcomponent of the mined block. Um, he has allocated from his uh, stash a total of, I believe, uh, 13 or so. Um, the, uh, is it 12? Uh, yeah, 12 that he's allocated. That leaves him with a balance of 13 um, at the end of this economy here on the right. Um, if you look at Alice, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. If you look at Alice there at the bottom, um, six and a half BC, uh, six and a half BTC was output to Alice. Uh, the input amount was seven BTC, so the spread of half a Bitcoin uh, was the minor tip, which is designated below. And then similarly in the top, uh, we have a minor tip of one Bitcoin above. Uh, and then on the right are the balances of everybody in the economy and what they would have if they opened up their phones and checked. Um, and the minor tips, those are anonymous people. We don't know who they are, at least in this economy. It's not always. Uh, that economy itself is a smaller subset of this larger diagram here. Um, you can see that that Coinbase is labeled transaction A. Uh, those two, uh, Alice and uh, Charlie, I believe, uh, are labeled B and C right there. And in the larger picture, this is going on all the time in the Bitcoin protocol. These allocations, these transactions, these checks uh, progress. And uh, time is starting on the left uh, and progressing to the right in this diagram. Um, you can see there that uh, in the rightmost uh, block, there is a transaction for which there are multiple inputs. Uh, that's kind of part of how uh, coin-based transactions work. But that's also part of how normal transactions work for all of us. Um, we, we may have received $50 here and $20 there. We pay somebody $70 in reference to two of those checks. A lot of this stuff is handled right now by banks. You don't see this, but this is certainly what goes on under the hood. Um, this, I'm also uh, illustrating, just in case there's any confusion, uh, that they don't have to be contiguous uh, references. So you can see that uh, somebody spent a Coinbase in block 301 to a transaction there in 302. In reality, there may be uh, hundreds of thousands of blocks even uh, between two people. Um, so uh, don't get the impression that they have to be uh, next to each other. Um, these balances go back as, as far as the blockchain and they can be spent uh, in perpetuity. So let's talk about the contracts just a bit. Um, as I said earlier, a spend is not an actual function per se. Uh, there is a contract that is enforced at the time of mining. Um, the language by which these contracts are written is a, is a language based on fourth. Um, it is stack based. Uh, there are no registers. Uh, unlike fourth, uh, it is not Turing complete. They've removed all uh, branching, no, not branching, I'm sorry, uh, all go-tos, um, all loops, all recursions. Uh, that was uh, mostly in an effort, I think, to uh, to uh, prevent uh, DOS type attacks, but uh, it also solves other problems, I would imagine, as well. Um, the stack is a little endian. The integers are variable length on the stack. Uh, the most significant bit control sign, which is a little weird, if you are familiar with these things. Um, and typically what a miner does is validate any transaction for truth. If the, if the transaction validates as true, uh, and uh, true is defined by non-zero, uh, and it is the topmost in integer in the stack, then that gets included into a block. Um, the block is mined, the block is passed around the network where everybody else validates truth, and it becomes part of the uh, blockchain. Um, if, if it does not validate for truth, um, it is disregarded by the miner. Um, and uh, similarly, if there's a div by zero or something like that, um, it would not uh, perpetrate, it would not uh, continue to go through the network. Um, about those contracts, uh, there's about 100 instructions available. Only a dozen or so are typically used. Uh, a lot of them are reserved uh, instructions, uh, which is very frustrating if you're trying to do something groundbreaking right now. Um, it's mostly for security precautions. Uh, the uh, language defines this notion of standard and non-standard contracts. 
Um, there's about four contract templates that are standard. Of those four, three are single spends, just the notion earlier, one to one person via check. One of those templates is a multi-sig transaction. Um, and if anybody wants to play with these, it's great, but keep in mind mistakes are final. Uh, there's a lot of people who uh, have sent money to uh, the null address saying they've lost that money. Uh, and some actual, like a counterparty, I think, um, some actual protocols require that feature of burning money in order to gain money or uh, proving stake in some other uh, language, which is kind of cool. Uh, so now that you know transactions, and that's probably the most complicated part of this, uh, we can talk about what a block is. Uh, a block primarily consists of all the mined transactions. Uh, these days, there's typically a couple hundred of them, as much as 600. The current maximum size of a block is about three quarters of a megabyte. Uh, that is the enforced constraint. Um, and of course, every block consists of a single Coinbase transaction, that is the printed money that the miner had just uh, performed. Um, inside the block as well, inside the header, there's a hash header of the prior block that's used for uh, not only organization, but also preventing people from mining early. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and there's the root of the mine transactions. It's important for people to understand that the block header is all that is hashed, uh, typically by miners, not the contents, at least not directly. And therein is what the uh, Merkle, uh, the Merkle root uh, is, is for in the header of the block. It is a fail safe for the, mine, for the network to know that the transactions have not been tampered with. Um, and there's a couple more safe, fail safes. Uh, the script itself is encrypted by the issuer. Um, but that's the primary uh, function of the network. It keeps people from relaying inventory that would be invalid, uh, or at least in somebody else's interest. Uh, and then there's the nonce, which is probably the most important part of what a, a miner, uh, miner would, would, would do. Um, here's a block, block number 299. On the left, you can see the entirety of the block. Uh, the transactions are listed A through G. Uh, there would be a couple hundred of those uh, in, in an actual transaction. Uh, the header there at the top is, is zoomed in. Uh, there's a number of fields, most of them are pretty standard to computer programmers. Uh, the hash fields there, you can see, um, hash the Merkle root, which provides a function of validating the transaction, the, uh, transaction contents there on the left. Um, the hash of the previous block, that's used to keep people from going ahead too far. You cannot mine block 301 without having mined block 300. That previous block hash uh, would prevent you from doing that. Uh, and that resets the entire network's mining operations every single block. It doesn't allow people to cheat by going ahead, pre-computing, and then announcing it. Um, the time is mostly a source of entropy uh, to assist in the uh, mining process. Um, and uh, the target bits is the difficulty. Uh, so let's talk about mining really quick. The gist of what a miner does is he tries to adjust the nonce, or whatever entropy that he can in that structure, such that he comes up with a hash as close to zero as possible using SHA-256 for that block. It's actually double SHA, but keep it easy. Um, he increments the NOS as many times as he needs to. He checks the value to see if the hash is close to zero. Um, he adjusts the time if needed. And um, he even uh, adjusts the local root uh, in some cases by typically uh, changing which public address he's uh, awarding the Coinbase to. But, um, the closer to zero, the more successful his, his hash was. Um, and the difficulty level is that degree of precision around zero. And that's constantly changing. Uh, so if you've ever really wondered, like, kind of more specifically, what it is a miner is doing with his hash, I think that's a pretty good overview. You can go through the source to really see that algorithm. It's not very big. You can do it in, like, Python, in, like, 20 lines or something. Oh. 40 lines tops, I think. So that's a block. Um, and then let's talk about what the blockchain is. The blockchain is uh, an order blocks uh, ordering of blocks, excuse me, uh, which if you all have seen any ledger ever, you'll notice that there's a chronological order to all transactions. And that is precisely uh, the function that's being performed in the blockchain, is we've ordered transactions. Uh, they're not ordered within the blocks per se, but they're ordered relative to the other blocks, which is very close. Um, the blockchain, as I said, contains every transaction that's ever occurred on the network. Uh, currently, we have about 305,000 blocks, 18 gigabytes worth of data. Uh, it's important when looking at the blockchain that you understand the block uh, height, is a measure of absolute time and distance. Um, the blocks are calibrated to be mined every 10 minutes. So when you look at a block height of 305,000, uh, you know that that is 10 minutes times 305,000 when the blockchain has been, uh, been around. Uh, it's not precisely 10 minutes, but it's about 10 minutes. Um, the block depth is a measure of relative time and distance. So if I talk about what happened five blocks ago, uh, that was 50 minutes ago, uh, or five blocks from now. Uh, easy enough. Um, the newer 0.9 release supports a uh, SPV mode, which is kind of cool uh, for mobile clients where an 18 gigabytes might be a little bit too much, or for routers where that's a little bit too much data to uh, contain. Uh, the SPV mode will let you uh, constrain that to about 23 megabytes, which is enough to do basic things, certainly mining. Uh, 
Um, and then, yeah, down the line, we have the option of pruning uh, the blockchain and compressing it by removing any unspent transactions from that block, uh, blockchain. Excuse me. And that would be very common as the velocity of money grows, uh, because otherwise, I'm going to get huge. So let's talk a little bit about what the miner does here. We, we definitely went over the process, uh, but just to reiterate, mostly, uh, the miner prevents double spends. He does that by ordering the transactions in the network. Uh, he appends transactions uh, from the mempool into a block. Uh, when he advertises that to other peers, they remove those transactions from their mempool. Um, he establishes a valid hash. He announces that block to the network. He says to the network, okay, you have 305. I've come up with 306. Here's 306. That propagates. Um, and then um, every 2016 blocks or so, the difficulties recal uh, recalibrate. That's every two weeks. If more miners enter the system, we want to keep that, that heartbeat of 10 minutes going. Um, regularly, so what we have to do is essentially accommodate by averaging all of the blocks that we've had, the times they're in, and adjust the difficulty level commensurate to ensure that in the next two-week period, we're still mining at a rate of 10, uh, and that controls money creation as well. I think that's genius, personally. Um, yeah, that's that. So, a quick little example of what, what goes down on the blockchain on a very regular basis. Um, here you can see the blockchain. Uh, it's progressing from 300 to 306. Uh, there are some failed forks in this blockchain, and that's very common. Uh, as I told you before, when the inventory hits 300, uh, and then one person announces 301, that's not necessarily going to reach the network in time to uh, hit everybody by the time an alternate 301 is formed. And this happens all the time. Uh, if someone in Japan mines 301, a half a second before somebody in the United States mines 301, um, there are now two competing versions of the history on the blockchain. Now, what happens at this point is that some percentage of the pool, let's say it's, uh, let's say it's 70 percent America and 30 percent Japan, uh, have one version of the block, and the 30 percent have another version of the block. And they keep continuing to mine based on the version that they know. Um, and in some amount of time, approximately 10 minutes, one of them will be successful with the next block, and they will advertise that to the whole network. Except in this case, there wasn't a tie. In this case, when 302 hit, uh, America has 70 percent of, of the mining power. Therefore, it was statistically more likely to arrive at an answer before the alternate path, and then announce 302 for the rest of the network to hear, uh, at which point they realized that they were mining the wrong block. It was wrong because it was secondary to the 302, and they heard it, they thought it, they heard it first, but somebody else has come up with a newer version. As such, all of those miners switched to 302, which is now the truth block, uh, and they progressed from there. They switch to 302 because their chances of success are going to be significantly higher, and the more than that go to 302 um, will continue to uh, spawn more to go to 302 until eventually all of them are there as the returns are diminishing for them to be pursuing uh, a failed path. Uh, and this happens regularly. So you can see that at 303, uh, both the United States and Japan have been on the same path. They hit 303, same path. Uh, at that point, same problem happens. Somebody in, let's say, Australia hits the block, and, and, off, and, and uh, Africa hits the block. Uh, they're competing, um, and that in this case maybe is closer to 50-50. They competed for two uh, links in the chain until finally uh, one of them wins out at 306 and the block proceeds. Uh, this prevents double spending because it preserves ordering uh, and, and incentivizing everybody to stay on the same ordering path. This, I think, one of the most uh, phenomenal inventions of our time is the primary innovation of Bitcoin, uh, and we'll see this used in all kinds of data structures and algorithms here, and uh, it's really uh, not a small deal. It's a big feat. So I think we can kind of answer a little bit now of like what is a Bitcoin. Uh, and I'm going to show you here it is 100 million Satoshis. Uh, because the protocol does not differentiate uh, anything whatsoever with Bitcoins. Uh, merely Satoshis, these are the smallest units. So if you're going through the source code, um, you'll see only reference to Satoshis. So let's try this again. Uh, what is a Satoshi? Uh, and uh, the Fed troll here will tell us it is an unspent output value addressed to your public key hash in a transaction in a block, on a blockchain. And that is what a Bitcoin is. For anybody who's ever heard any number of analogies that's inconsistent with this, those analogies are wrong, they're meant to help you, and they probably did, and I use this. Um, with this in mind, I just want to talk really briefly about the near future of Bitcoin and some, some immediate uh, developments that you can expect. Um, certainly, uh, HTTP integration is, uh, is relatively new. Um, in integrating with HTTP, we now have mine types for uh, Bitcoin payment uh, and Bitcoin payment requests. Uh, you will see um, through this uh, HTTPS style uh, infrastructure, PKI infrastructure, certificates identifying vendors and identifying um, clients, and um, transactions will likely go through HTTP. Um, in addition to that, uh, there is this notion of bonding uh, that is, it's been around since the start of Bitcoin, but I think it's getting used more. 
when you write a transaction, that is a bond, that is a check that you have written, and you can fork that over to anybody without necessarily posting that onto the network uh, directly. So this really makes NFC easy, because what would happen in some scenarios is you go to a POS system, but maybe your phone doesn't have internet, but you really want to buy your coffee. So uh, in this case, you would sign a transaction, you would post that bond via NFC to the terminal. The terminal who has an internet connection uh, will then relay that onto the blockchain. It will get confirmed, you'll get your coffee, and everybody's happy. Uh, and you'll see that in a number of different scenarios uh, as well, not just NFC. Uh, this also kind of gets into uh, BIP70. Uh, BIP is the uh, Bitcoin improvement uh, proposal uh, for instant confirmations. Uh, that itself is an entire presentation, uh, but the gist of that is instant confirmations. Right now, confirmations happen every 10 minutes when the block is pressed. Um, and uh, with BIP70, you have varying insurance options to ensure that uh, the vendor will not get screwed and the per person purchasing his coffee gets in and out in five seconds or less. Um, you can expect more contracts. Certainly, there's a lot of really cool ones uh, being proposed. Um, side chains are going to be extremely big, uh, I believe. Side chains essentially let you check Bitcoins out of the Bitcoin network and back an alternate currency. Um, if you are maybe starting the next Dogecoin, but you don't have reason for people to believe it's worth anything, you can back it in Bitcoin. Uh, or maybe you want uh, to back your fiat currency if you're some other country. Um, you, I could foresee that being used that they would back their, uh, their, their country's dollars in Bitcoin. It might take a while, but the feature's there at least if anyone wants to use it. Starbucks coin. Or absolutely, Starbucks coin. Absolutely correct. Very good point. Basically check out because they control the blockchain and the time. Yes, very good point. A lot of what we think of as the gift certificates for either Starbucks or Outback or what have you, very easily be back with uh, Bitcoin at some point, and there would be all kinds of advantages to doing that. Uh, they get all the hashing power of the network, they get uh, the, the faith of the network, and, and on and on. Um, yeah, and for anybody who's interested in this, look at the BIPs, they're really, really cool. Um, some of the stuff people are proposing are pretty wild, um, and I, I recommend it highly. Uh, and this is my last slide here. Uh, I want to end this on some notes um, relating to scalability. Um, one of the common criticisms against Bitcoin is that it would not scale. I think that is completely wrong. Uh, Visa handles about 4,000 transactions per second, uh, 10,000 10, transactions peak. Uh, PayPal uh, comes in at a comparatively small 46 transactions per second. Uh, and Bitcoin comes out at a very, very small one transaction per second. Uh, that one transaction per second is primarily an artificially imposed constraint. Uh, that number has been growing over time and will continue to grow. Uh, Gavin and Jeff decide what to constrain this as, mostly in, in an effort to reduce latency and combat spam. As more and more people are mining, as more and more people are running nodes, that number will go up and up and up. Uh, I believe that a better um, constraint on, um, on the scalability of the network would be related to the validation speed of the nodes. Uh, that, seems to be the, uh, that seems to be the general consensus. Uh, a typical desktop CPU can validate about 4,000 transactions per second, which brings us right there with uh, Visa. Uh, it's, it's presumable that in such an environment, uh, we would probably be offloading a lot of that service to uh, mining operations, uh, nonetheless, um, or your wallets, uh, I'm sorry, your wallet providers, uh, who would be running ASICs or some such thing to, to do those validations. Uh, at 4,000 TPS, it is a math. Uh, it's about two megabytes of network traffic per second, uh, which isn't that bad. Um, certainly your cable modem can handle that. Uh, that will uh, make the blockchain pretty huge in very little time, but um, pruning unspent outputs I think will help that. So I don't see any reason why this can't compete with the credit cards uh, and probably more uh, thereafter. And I certainly expect that it will. Um, and, I, and I think I want to leave you with this. Uh, the biggest uh, concerns that Satoshi had uh, were related to scalability. And I, I think these were wise concerns. But his concerns weren't about the network speed. I think they were more about the socioeconomic impacts. And, uh, and I share those. I, I think that Bitcoin's a wonderful thing, but we can't grow too quickly uh, because there are big changes in foot. And that's it. That's my presentation. Uh, I hope we found some of this useful. Uh, if you did, I, we collect tips here. This is for our meeting. Uh, this goes to pizza. Uh, so if anybody feels compelled to uh, throw a dollar in or something, we'll buy a group of pizza next week. Um, and I would certainly appreciate that. But thank you, everyone. What, yes, how can I, uh, what do you got? Okay, Chris, uh, what about the size of the block? Right. Everybody, they In terms of scalability? Right. Right, so one of the nice things about approving unspent outputs is that it works particularly well in environment where there's a high velocity of money. So in this environment where there is a lot of transactions going on, um, that would be an ideal environment to take out the transactions for which the outputs have already been allocated. We don't need those anymore in order to compute uh, new balances and such. So I think that it will compress pretty well. Uh, and certainly, if we're doing 4,000 transactions per second, I think there's going to be many, many terabytes available to us to use uh, on wallet providers and data processing servers, uh, in addition to you know, perhaps the uh, hobbyist nodes as well. Um, I think somebody over here had a question I wanted to answer earlier. 
regarding to the um, incentive um, for people to use Bitcoin over credit card uh, in a security context. And while it's true, yeah, and while it's true that you are uh, liable for most fifty dollars, um, what I would suggest is that a lot of the adoption incentives on the vendor end in that respect. The vendors have to worry about chargebacks. The vendors are the ones who typically absorb the, the burden of the security problems. And what I expect will happen is the vendors will offer a discount uh, for people paying in Bitcoin. You see that already to a certain degree. Um, and I think that the consumer end, which we'll probably find is convenience, will drive adoption more so than the yeah. incentive. Send, send the QR code. Near, NF, NFCs will, will almost certainly replace the QR codes. And I think that that'll be a great into your phone. And it'll be as automatically as it's certainly going to your wallet and taking out a card. Any, any other questions? So a lot of what you described as far as the transaction goes related to credit card and Bitcoin, as the popularity grows, if it you know takes off as it should, wouldn't it become regulated and therefore need to um, incur you know, more costs? So I highly encourage regulation, which is a little bit um, unusual, I think, for somebody in this field. I think it's really going to help a lot of people wrap their minds around it and understand the technology. Um, but I would also cer certainly suggest to anybody um, that uh, Bitcoin is an international phenomenon. So for all the regulation that there is in the United States, we have to compete in our regulation standards with other countries now. And so it would probably be in our interest not to regulate it too much uh, for fear that maybe other companies are providing services internationally um, you know, at our expense due to increasing efficiency. But yeah, I would, I would definitely ask for uh, more regulation. I can't see how it hurts. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> can decibels of bitcoins be transacted? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. The satoshis are the, the smallest invisible unit. So, in the same way that a penny is one one hundredth of a dollar, a satoshi is one, I believe, two to the what? It's uh, well, ten to the negative to the ninth. To the ninth is that what it is? It's yeah. hundred million satoshis. There you go. Yeah. So then, yeah, ten to the negative to ninth. So yeah, they're very different. Yeah. Okay, so how do you convert your Bitcoins back to U.S. currency? Uh, Coinbase is the easiest um, to do. Um, <coughs> I've been doing this for a while, and, and when we started this, there was a bunch of people that were really uh, kind of like a libertarian types, anti-authoritarian uh, authority types. And for me, I think that that's fine. I don't see that that hurts. I think that was needed to get the movement to a certain point. Um, but I, I find that the Bitcoin potential is really in conducting transactions as a payment uh, mechanism to replace magnetic stripes. And so while I think it's wonderful that anybody would want to own Bitcoin, and I certainly do, and I recommend it, um, where I see this succeeding immediately and in not much time is in replacing credit cards. Um, and so towards your, answering your question, there are services like Circle, wherein you will be completely abstracted from any nuance of Bitcoin. And all you'll know is you're paying via NFC, and that you're paying via maybe QR codes, and that the network is, is transacting all of that behind the scenes, and all the exchanging is done uh, with zero cost to you, and it's maximally convenient. Um, and so I don't think people are really going to go on average back and forth from Bitcoin to dollars at first. Um, if that becomes a mainstream phenomenon, uh, they're starting to hit this like, event horizon where it's really hard to predict at what point Bitcoins may stand now to compete with more traditional fiat currency mechanisms. And that's, a, that's, that's somebody else's answer. Maybe the historians, I don't know.